So I wanted to make this video because I've had conversations with riders way too often about how food has had a negative impact on their bike racing. So I wanted to normalize these conversations a little bit so that we can break down the anxieties and shift our understanding and our perspective of feeling for performance and make it just something that's a little bit more healthy and sustainable and positive. I want this video to be like an open discussion. I'm definitely not an expert and this is not a how-to video, but I am studying nutrition at university and I work regularly with a nutritionist at the Scottish Institute of Sport. And I do feel like as a rider racing at my level, it's my obligation to kind of use the platform that I have to share some of my own experiences and hopefully help some of you gain an understanding or reassurance that food is fast. <laughs> I do believe that we develop a natural body weight and if we constantly try to fight this whilst pushing our bodies to the limits, long-term damage is a very real thing and we need to be able to recognize the initial stages of this. Athletes shouldn't be trying to find the balance between leanness and performance. We should be focusing on being healthy, strong and fast. And we do this by fueling adequately. Whatever the weighing scales say is fairly irrelevant if we're training consistently, eating well and maintaining a lifestyle that allows us to maximize that process of improvement. There are a lot of things in sport that can go wrong, most of which are rectifiable. Underfueling is one way to ensure that you're not going fast anywhere. In sport, I think there are two primary reasons that people develop an unhealthy relationship with food. And I think they're body image and performance. It's strange that in a sport that represents the whole spectrum of physical builds, there's still this underlying pressure to pursue a certain body type. And I think social media has a massive role to play in this by often focusing on the aesthetic traits of female athletes rather than skill. And I think we all know that happens. But we as, as riders and athletes can help to shift that focus by using social media as a tool to share experiences and thoughts. Like if we invest in what we say and what we do rather than how we look, then we can fill young riders' feeds with a productive, honest insight into the world of bike racing, bringing them knowledge instead of anxiety. My experience of unhealthy eating habits never really came from a desire to look a certain way. It was very performance focused. But both of these things develop into the same unsustainable relationship with food. So both are very relevant to talk about. Weight is a huge part of our sport. Brands are claiming that their new product is the lightest on the market. Weight is very relevant when discussing components. And whilst thinking about this video, I realized that I contribute to the very thing that essentially stirred anxiety in me initially by telling you how like my bike is, for example. As a developing rider, my thing was kind of my climbing ability, but I nurtured the skill with a really damaging mindset. I always thought if my bike had to like be as light as possible, then I did too. And for about two years, I consistently, but quite subtly under eight, thereby underperforming and essentially spending most of my World Cup years consumed by disappointment. And I think when you're eating just a, a little bit less than you should be. It's hard to make the connection between that action and the performance. The immediate reaction is to eat less and be even lighter. And I think it's a similar mindset to people who overtrain and then perform badly and they go back to the drawing board thinking that they need to train even more when in actual fact they need rest. And I think if you really tragically under eat for a training session, you can feel the impact for a few days after that. And I've done that before. And it makes me realize if you're subtly but consistently not eating quite enough, then that is has having a negative impact over time and could actually be quite significant to your performance. In 2017, we were um, in between World Cup races and my coach forced me to eat a Magnum after a really bad performance. I think it was Alpstadt World Cup. And he probably doesn't even remember it happening, but it was probably the most important thing he did for my racing that year. I've come across a couple of terms used to describe various symptoms of unhealthy eating and these have helped me identify some of the symptoms that I had. So hopefully they'll be able to help some of you as well. This describes somebody who displays symptoms of an eating disorder, but not severe enough to diagnose as one. It's essentially a precursor to the condition. And I would say my own experience probably fits into this category.
I'm quoting this one, a medical condition in which the sufferer systematically avoids specific foods that they believe to be harmful. I came across this term really recently and I'm really glad to learn that it's being identified as its own condition. For a long time, this was the center of my eating habits. I would essentially avoid anything that I thought was unhealthy, like white carbs, fruit juice, ketchup. <laughs> if the option was between, you know, something like this or nothing, then I would always choose to go hungry. It's really important that you guys know what I mean when I use the word healthy in this video. Uh, when I use it, I mean balanced, nutritional and adequate for performance. I do not mean the absence of cake, chocolate and sweets, essential and positive part of high performance in sport. I used to think that not having a period was normal for high performing athletes. And when I stopped having mine, I just assumed that I had reached that level as well. coach or do a bit of research yourself to find out. I had a few questions on training around periods and I don't feel like well equipped to talk about it really because it's not been a, an issue personally. So I'd really love if somebody else would talk about this. <laughs> somebody asked me about racing on your period. Again, it's not a massive problem for me. I can kind of work around it. I know that some riders use a contraceptive pill, which kind of eliminates this problem altogether. But I personally, wouldn't recommend that because I think, especially when you're racing and competing at a high level, it's really important to monitor your period because it is an indicator of, of long-term health. I've had a regular period now for just over a year, but it probably took me one or two years of consistent, healthy eating habits for me to get it back. And now it's a really positive thing every month when I get it. Everyone should check out Evie Richards' post on this. We need more top athletes talking about this openly and she did an amazing job so go check it out. I think metrics can be a really useful training tool if used correctly but there needs to be more conscious consideration of whether asking an athlete to log or monitor certain things is appropriate for that athlete. I've got quite an obsessive personality type so I tend to lean towards numbers and structure as a way to kind of find control in a situation and this manifested itself in addictive use of the weighing scales, weighing my food, and a seriously unhealthy satisfaction every time my skin folds came back just on the right side of healthy. And I've learned over time to minimize my use of metrics for my well-being and my performance, and because quite often I think they can provide limited information that doesn't necessarily overlap with other factors or have much context. Athletes are often asked to record their weight using an app or on their training file or something like that. And I think at times this can be okay or even beneficial, but only if an initial discussion is taking place to make sure that one, the rider is comfortable doing so, and two, the purpose of the exercise is understood by both parties. I think the absence of this conversation can be a player in athletes developing a pressure to ma maintain a certain body weight without understanding why. They might not be confident enough to say that they don't want to do it, or as in my case, they might actively gain enjoyment from weighing themselves as long as that number is the number they want to see. And if that number is higher than desired, then that could determine the athlete's mindset for the rest of that day or even week. In my case, the number I saw on the weighing scales certainly created an underlying pressure to eat less if the number wasn't what I wanted to be in an attempt to then the following day bring that number down. And that's kind of how the downward spiral started of weighing myself more and more often seeking this, this magic number that didn't exist. <laughs> Lots of folk have asked me about fueling appropriately and eating the right things on rides. My nutritionist gave me two really simple rules to follow that are now kind of habitual. 
and both helped me to learn that food is a really positive part of the sport and something to look forward to. First, he told me to keep my three main meals the same size every day, regardless of training. Initially, I found this quite difficult, but I kind of learned to silence any diets I have. And now I don't even think about portion size. I just eat until I'm full. And if I feel during my training effectively, then this kind of works out roughly the same each day in my meals. The second rule is be quite strict with when you're going to eat during your rides so that you almost don't have to think about whether you're hungry. You already know when you're going to eat. For example, if I have a three hour ride, then I will eat at 50 minutes, an hour and 40 minutes and two and a half hours. I generally eat once an hour, but this is very personal. Some people may need to eat more um, and are more regularly or less. And it takes practice to figure this out. It's a long term investment, quite often during big training blocks. You're not necessarily eating for the here and now. Your body needs adequate fuel to optimize that session and then repair, rebuild and recover when you're off the bike ready for the next day. And if you're doing this multiple days in a row, then you just basically, you need to be quite strict with your eating because you can end up, can end up getting to the end of a training week just unable to complete the sessions. I would normally go for high carb content snacks, but I never know exactly how many carbs are in each thing. I, I don't uh, count calories or anything like that. I make a lot of my own riding food and I freeze it so that I have a couple of different choices for rides to keep it interesting. I realize that like this is part of my job and it's not realistic to expect everyone to have time to prepare their like homemade riding snacks. This is why I use Torque because they have really natural simple ingredients, their stuff tastes good and it ticks the boxes in terms of what I need for the session. Somebody asked me how I avoid the temptation of Mars bars and rides and when I got this question. I was sitting on my sofa eating lint balls, which was very funny. From a holistic point of view, I avoid a lot of sugary and processed foods anyway, and I tried to fill my plates with color and variety, but I definitely enjoy a regular treat. And I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with having a Mars bar on a ride. <laughs> Charlie Aldridge basically only eats Kit Kats in training and he's world champion. So. Eating at the right times has definitely come up a lot in discussion around food, such as like not overeating on rest days or eating less later in the day. Really, I don't think any of this stuff is relevant if you're already struggling with healthy eating habits. If you wake up on a rest day starving because you forgot to fuel enough during training the day before, then just eat, pal. <laughs> I think it's much healthier to focus on getting enough fuel around training uh, than worrying about eating at the wrong time on the wrong days. One of my favorite questions was, do you think riders who eat normally and don't think about it too much are missing a trick? I love this because no, <laughs> you guys are the guys doing it right, in my opinion. It's so easy to overthink food, but if you wanna be fast, you gotta ride hard, challenge yourself technically, and eat, eat, eat. Consistency is key, and food's not an exception to that rule. If you only do one thing after watching this video, then make it this. Go and look at women's XE World Cup podium photos from over the years and then try and argue that cycling requires a specific body type for success.